And then we were standing looking down on the forward part of the ship just as we saw a crack go across it. And uh, then not long after, about four or five waves afterwards, the whole bow of the ship lifted up uh, just forward of the first set of king pokes and was moved over a few hundred yards and the stuff spilled out of the holes which were now open as a cross section. Nobody seemed to be doing anything. We were just waiting for to be swallowed up by the sea. And besides which was only a hundred feet or so across or a hundred yards. So uh, it was easier to go and try and do something. And what I figured is I could go across that, and take a line with me. And the seas were pouring through the slot. Five guys were going to pull me back after I got the line ashore. So I had a line tied around me. When I went in, in I was swept off by a wave. And that's when I found out the thing that kept me from abandoning ship and that killed so many of the guys. I couldn't swim. I couldn't do anything. A wave came, carried me down. I must have been carried down about 15 or 20 feet. The life jacket, fortunately, was tied tight and that pulled me up. I, was, I couldn't move my arms. It was fro I was, when, I was when I came back up, I couldn't move. I was just paralyzed. And that's pretty much what happened to everybody. And I was a lot better swimmer than most of the guys on that ship. Uh, I couldn't move a thing. And nobody was pulling me back to the ship. And I remember thinking, you bastards are letting me drown. And I started to yell, pull me up, pull me up. And uh, I lost consciousness. But I lost consciousness just as I was starting up the side of the thing. And what happened is they couldn't pull me up because the line was so full of oil that the hand slipped. Fortunately, Will Trout, a coxswain, took the line and made himself a winch. He tied the line around him, and the four other guys kept turning him. And that's the only reason why I came back on board. But it's also the only reason why I was never going to go in that water again. Uh, but I remember thinking, Jesus, I'm going to die because guys had now abandoned ship, and they'd all gone down. And you could see them floating in the water with, uh, covered with oil and smothering to death. And our life jackets, uh, one of the things that we were taught in reserve, and thank God for it, was to always tie our collars tight. And the reason for it was clear because as guys hit the water, this freezing water, because it was 30 degrees, water temperature was 30 degrees, they'd be paralyzed. And the pressure of the life jackets and the weakness of their arms would push their arms up like this and the life jackets would smother them and they'd be floating with their arms up. So there were all sorts of things happening with guys going down. I guess about half the ship was our reserve outfit and half were regular Navy. So these are guys that I'd, some of which I'd gone to school with, that I'd gone to drills with once a week, that we'd gone to camp or on two-week cruises together. And uh, two of them were extremely good friends of mine outside of the reserve. And the rest were all people that uh, I knew, and, or most of them, I knew well. I didn't know many of the black gang, the engineers, but everybody else I'd known for years. So it was, in that way, it was worse than if it had been a normal naval casualty where you only knew a few guys, really. But you knew their wives, and you knew their sisters and brothers and everything else. And you knew, uh, you know, after, after it, when, when it was all over and I got through it, you knew you had the problem which occurred of getting letters from people you know about what happened to, to Will.